hundred percent of the population in Gaza is at severe levels of acute food insecurity. That's the first time an entire population has been so classified. 100% of Gaza's population is currently facing severe levels of acute food insecurity. That is a staggering milestone and a chilling first in recorded history that lays bare the gravity of this crisis. Secretary Antony Blinken was referring to a United Nations-backed assessment released earlier this week, which also warns that famine could overtake northern Gaza as soon as this May. Now, 70% of the population there is already facing what's called catastrophic hunger, meaning people have so little food that they are effectively starving. These things start to blend together. There's catastrophic hunger, there's food insecurity, there's famine, and it's all bad. For weeks now, people throughout the enclave have been reduced to eating bird seed, animal fodder, and weeds. The UN estimates that, war, estimates that without immediate intervention, Gaza could witness over 200 deaths per day, not from bombs, not from weaponry, from starvation. 200 deaths per day from starvation. Many aid workers say famine is already underway in Gaza, including the leading famine expert, Alex DeWall, who predicts that this will be the most intense famine since World War I, not caused by drought or a failure of crop. Experts warn that Israel plans for a ground offensive in the southern city of Rafah, where 1.5 million people are seeking refuge, and that could hasten the arrival of the famine. While recent media coverage is focused on proposals like floating piers and airdrops, aid workers say these headlines overshadow the unfolding crisis on the ground and warn that these efforts will not avert famine without an immediate end to the war and a massive influx of aid. Welcome to a very special Monday edition of the Nick and CJ show. I'm one of your hosts. I'm CJ. What's up, Nick? What's poppin'? My friends, my family, we are back. Once again, for another episode of Nick and CJ, and it's a, a a great day to be here because we got Shama Sawana. It's been a while since we had her on the show, so it's, it's going to be great to be in conversation with her. And I cannot emphasize this before I pass to you, CJ, and we introduce our guest. We have a famine that's going on in Gaza, and as this is going on, the leading superpower and military that is supplying the weapon for the famine just cut aid to UNRWA including a lot of Democrats who was virtue signaling on this issue recently. They all voted uh, for the uh, for the Senate bill that just passed. They just they voted for the resolution that cut UNRWA. Biden signed it, as there's a famine that's going on right now. So don't let the headlines fool you that this is Netanyahu that's gone rogue. This is a coordinated famine that was programmed and developed by the West, teamed up with Israel. Do not let Biden off the hook. I had to uh, chime in with that. Uh, CJ, I'll pass to you so you can introduce our guests or anything else you want to chime in with. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll save my comments because we're going to get right to that in just a, in like the second or third question. We're going to get right to that. The breaking news also with the UN Council uh, passing a resolution. So we're gonna, we're gonna get to all of that, but let's give her the proper introduction. Like you said, we haven't seen, we haven't had the opportunity to have her on this net, on this channel. She's been on the broader RBN network, maybe the Savvy channel, maybe the JB channel, but on this channel in conversation with Nick and CJ, it's been a while and it's a long time coming, but Give, to give her the proper uh, introduction, I mean, most of our audience know who she is, but if you don't, she is a, a, a Seattle uh, City Council person from 2014 to 2023. She she started um, Social Alternative. She's also is part of the Worker Strike Back. And one of her newest things is On Strike, which is her, her podcast. And we're gonna be uh, 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 talking about some of those clips but let's bring on finally uh, who we have not seen in a long while, Shama Sawat. How are you doing? Oh, I think, are you on mute? I don't think yeah, you're sure on mute. Your we can't hear you. I can't hear.
Yeah, you may you may try had to try to refresh, Shama. For some reason, we can't. Yeah, hear. you may have to oh, go yeah. out. Can and you hear me now? Yes. Oh, there we go. Oh wow, I don't know what you did, but great. <laughs> there you go. But welcome anyway, and um, thank you for joining us today for this very very needed conversation. But how are you doing? First of all, I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Hey, doing pretty back. pretty good. <laughs> They're pretty good. Um, well, first, let's just get right into, you know, we I played the introductory video where it was talking about what's currently uh, happening in, in Gaza with the, the famine. Just uh, it, what is your general sort of analysis, your general take on what's happening in Gaza uh, before we get into some more of the meat and potatoes of the conversation? Obviously, as the clips you played indicated, Nick and CJ, it is absolutely horrific what is taking place in Gaza. And it's not an act of God. It is a direct product of imperialist policies. It is a, a war being conducted by the Israeli state, including by some of the most vicious right wing elements. And it is a war that is only possible because it is explicitly being backed up by U.S. and Western imperialism. And, there, you know, there's been talk about the U.N. resolution. I think it should be acknowledged. And it's important to acknowledge that this U.N. resolution and also the murmurings that we're starting to hear, you know, Kamala Harris saying ceasefire. I mean, obviously, we have to look at the small print to see what they actually mean. But the fact that uh, the resolution was passed, Kamala Harris saying ceasefire, Chuck Schumer saying ceasefire, Gavin Newsom saying ceasefire. The fact that prominent Democrats are having to pay even the mildest sort of lip service towards the fact, you know, towards what millions of Americans and, and really the majority of Americans are, are demanding. All of that shows the pressure that they are under from the anti-war protests combined with the uncommitted efforts in now you're seeing in battleground states like Michigan and Arizona and also other states like Minnesota and Washington. I think all of this is to, to whatever degree there is pressure on U.S. imperialism and the Biden administration. It is credit to the anti-war protests, both in the United States and globally and the uncommitted effort here. Uh, but at the same time, of course, we have to note that uh, we we cannot be complacent from from this sort of lip service that is being paid because, as you guys pointed out, at the same time that these Democrats are uh, saying these things that might sound like their that their position is shifting, at the same time, as you said, only uh, three days ago, the uh, House of Representatives approved this 1.2 trillion dollar funding bill ban, you know, banning the funding for relief and aid in Gaza at a time when there is an unprecedented humanitarian catastrophe that is unfolding. And I also wanted to say, you know, on the question of famine, it should be noted that famines and other such devastating occurrences are never the result of any kind of, uh, you know, incidental breakdown in uh, some sort of system or accidental occurrences, or it's just foolishness. These are at every moment in uh, the history of capitalism and imperialism, when famines have occurred, they have been an explicit and systematic product of imperialist policies. I'll, I'll just say, obviously not to make any kind of uh, unwarranted comparisons, but if you look at the history of India, my home country, under British imperialism, there were repeated famines, but economists have proved that those famines were directly a result of uh, specific policies that were carried out and so this, just like that, what's happening in Gaza is a result of uh, just the bloody policies of U.S. imperialism. And it's and, and you know, and, and obviously in our conversation, we have to take note that it is not happening as just one war. It is happening in the context of the new Cold War era that we are in, mm -hmm. where the U.S. led bloc and the China led bloc both have their cynical objectives in order to you know fight for dominion over the world's spoils but at the end of the day working people and poor people and oppressed people across the globe are going to be suffering and we should not join with either of these two forces of imperialism but instead we need international solidarity on the working class basis i mean you you touched on so many points that we are, we're going to address um with some receipts cuz i do want to take them one by one but i do want to insert this since we're talking about some of the latest of what's happening 
you know, with the situation in Gaza. And that's this news, Nick. And I'll let you sort of read your tweet, Nick, and then I'll play the video once you're ready uh, for it, sir. Yeah, this oh. is the, the the tweet uh, I put out. You, I saw a video with uh, uh, with Trump. Well, tr even Trump in a recent interview, I might cover it tomorrow, where he says that he was like, "Man, you guys got to finish the war, but you guys are losing the war." And I and I sent out a tweet earlier as well. Where I was like, "Do you guys know how bad it is when you had a leading Republican candidate that have to acknowledge that Israel lost the PR war?" So United States influence is now as at an all time low. You had this war that is also hurting the Ukraine war efforts. You notice how they had to change their language about around Ukraine. It wasn't about standing up for human rights anymore. It's about a crazy conspiracy theory about Putin invading Europe and the rest of the world and preventing Russia from invading Europe for some reason. They had to completely change their PR campaign. It really messed up the Ukraine war. It messed up their legitimacy on the world stage, it's breaking up their relationships with many countries in the global south. It's it's causing giant harm on the United States in terms of not even like a peace left analysis, but like if your analysis, I want the United States to be strong. The United States teaming up with Israel in this war has been horrific. Their UN votes have been essentially uh, like when you hear the applause, like for example, we play this video, you hear the applause when the United States choose to abstain, they lost the respect of the entire world. Like there are a lot of people, and I mentioned this before, in like Sweden and Finland and in, in Eastern Europe, who was all for the Ukraine proxy war, who was sweet summer children who really thought that the United States was fighting this war because of human rights and war crimes who's been disillusioned uh, with the United States because of that. So uh, as I say here, they Israel officially lost the PR war. Zionism is in the dustbin of history now. Uh, so you can play a video. I don't, I don't have anything else you want. Yeah, and um, again, yeah, the video will speak for itself. I'll, I'll play. I'll play both of them, but we'll start with this one here. The in document S slash twenty twenty four slash two hundred. Hang on one second. Let me make this larger, everybody. With those in favor of the draft resolution. One more second. There we go. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2024-254 please their, raise their hand? Those against? Abstention. The result of the voting is as follows. 14 votes in favor, zero vote against, one abstention. The draft resolution you see has been adopted there? as resolution 2728. Yeah. That's the war finally acknowledging. We finally got those motherfuckers. The United States finally can't. Gold hard no. Tell me anything you want to add. Anything you want to add to this? Any reactions? Yeah, just a, a couple of uh, I feel extremely important things for us to note as uh, a working class that wants to end this war and uh, wants to change the direction of society. I think first of all we should note that uh, whatever, as I was noting earlier, just to sort of draw a fine, fine point on it, is that. Whatever progress we see, such as this UN resolution, all of that is credit to working people and young people who have marched on the streets across the world. I think it's important for us not to have illusions in the, the capitalist governments of various countries, be it Sweden or Finland or South Africa. It doesn't matter. Really, when they are voting yes on such a resolution, what they are doing is reflecting the pressure from working people in their own nations in order to stand against U.S. imperialism. So we have to make a distinction between the, the, the political and ruling elite in each of these nations because we are in a capitalist world. Each of these nations is a capitalist nation. And so uh, our, our um, 
our the, the hand we extend is to working people in those countries who are putting pressure on their own governments not on those governments themselves because for the most part these governments ultimately represent the interests of western imperialism but also at these moments like this they are you know they are they feel pressure to express some of the discontentment that they see in their own countries and you know they ultimately they have political futures their own careers to think of so you know in, in terms of all of those calculations you see this kind of progress so we have to be very clear credit goes to the rank and file of the anti-war movement uh, but mm -hmm. the other thing also to note is that i mean and i don't know uh, i haven't looked up the all the fine print of this resolution and if you guys know you should definitely share it but i don't think that it includes any language about the us ending its military funding and without that, I think it, it's sort of meaningless to say, well, this is a binding resolution, but what does that mean to uh, how, can, how can you, in, in actuality, how can Netanyahu and the Israeli state be forced to pull back and start, uh, you know, end this war and not to mention the horrific uh, situation that they have created with the famine and malnutrition unless the U.S. withdraws and ends permanently the the material support for their uh, for conducting their war i mean obviously there is real pressure on the us imperialism as well and so you can see some of that uh, showing up in all the examples that i was just saying but also in the fact that they are having to publicly to some degree distance themselves from netanyahu's uh, most extreme positions there's also this struggle of you know well we don't want escalation of ground war in Rafa, but Netanyahu has his own calculations for why he wants to continue. So you see those kinds of debates breaking out among imperialist forces. But at the end of the day, what actual promises are they making? That has to be taken into consideration. In fact, it's telling that in, um, in the aftermath of this resolution passing, the White House said that the vote does not represent a shift in policy. So again, you know, they're not actually making any promises about uh, ending this war, but they are having to uh, show some sort of rhetorical shifts because of the pressure they're under. The other very important point to note in uh, in the clips you played and also what you were saying, Nick and CJ, is that we can be under no illusion that Trump 2.0 is going to be some sort of anti-war regime if Trump were to be elected. Trump is an absolutely, uh, absolutely ho horrific purveyor of war and attacks on all kinds of communities. And so uh, we cannot see him as an anti-war candidate, but you're right that because of the horrendous position that the Biden administration and the Democratic Party have taken, it is and the absence, and this is the most crucial thing that we should be discussing, of course, is the absence of any real viable alternative to the Biden as a candidate and Trump as a candidate. Trump is able to pose as the anti-war, to some degree anyway, anti-war. But he, we know he's not anti-war. Trump is, uh, in fact, he has promised that he's going to be, he said something like, I'll be, uh, I won't be a dictator ex except for on day one, which is a clever way of saying I'm going to be a dictator. And that is ominous. <laughs> and we also don't have any other, I mean, we don't, RFK is not an anti-war candidate. In fact, he is a grotesquely pro-Israeli state and pro-war. It's actually stunning to what degree he is. And so uh, we have to be very clear going into November that neither Trump nor a candidate like RFK represents an alternative to Trump and Biden and the warmongering two parties of capitalism and US capitalism and imperialism. But what that means concretely is uh, something that's important, which is obviously we want the Jill Stein and Cornell West campaigns to do much better than they have. Uh, it's unfortunate that Cornell West, even though he genuinely has a long history of being uh, anti-Israeli state war hasn't really raised his profile, his campaign's profile in the way that he needs to. But concretely, what we are saying through Socialist Alternative and Workers Strike Back is that we cannot trust either Trump or Biden. But the only way to break out of this logjam is to uh, 
really you know push for a vote for a Jill Stein or Cornell West, depending on who's on the ballot in your state, but as a step for stepping stone towards building a new party for working people. That without that, we don't really have any solution to ending the war or to uh, really pushing forward for the needs of working people in the US. Yeah, there, there's that, a, there's, CJ, you mind if I take something real quick? No, go ahead. Do, do, do you. There's a lot, uh, and there are a lot of great things said there. I want to get your thoughts on Ensar Allah in Yemen, because I give a lot of credit to the civil rights lawyers that represented the case in South Africa, who I'm sure will go down as anti-genocide legends. And from my uh, analysis, South Africa didn't really benefit much, much from fighting against Israel and opposing their genocide. So I want to get your thoughts on what like Ensar Allah is doing, because I, I find them to be the most effective form of resistance. Because if you want to criticize South Africa or China and Russia for not doing enough, you have Yemen, Ensar Allah that's actually doing direct action with the diplomatic support of Russia and China. So, Shama, I want to get your thoughts on what you see out of Yemen and Ensar Allah and what the best way for state active actors to actually resist genocide. I think that um, a lot of what we see this of, of examples of the kind you're saying show that there is, I mean, it, what they represent ultimately is the real search for a way to fight back in every country. And you know, even in the Middle East, you can see that millions of people are angry at the war and devastation that Palestinian people are facing. And um, they have been under, they have been uh, protesting on the streets in the Middle East. But at the end of the day, what do you see? Uh, you see the regimes in the Middle East, whether it is Egypt or the United Arab Emirates or other countries, they are, and especially Saudi Arabia. Let's not forget Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, Jordan, too, is another. Yeah, these, these regimes, these regimes do not represent the interests of ordinary people. I mean, you know, we cannot see it from the lens of, well, you're Arab, so you're going to be on the side of the Palestinians. Ultimately, it is about uh, uh, which um, which section of society under capitalism they represent, and ultimately, they represent the elite and. Uh, so we, um, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that we need to distinguish between some of the faces of these these developments that you see, for example, the government of South Africa being an example of this kind of face versus what they what all the, what is going on the ground that they are being forced to represent. And, and I'm making this point because it's very important for us not to have illusions on um, in the sort of the heads of states of uh, um, um, so to say, you know, I mean, it's 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 important that the representative of Yemen in the UN said that the resolution must be considered as a first step leading to a binding resolution on a permanent ceasefire. Um, it's that's that's important, but it's a question of are they are they are these you know the 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 people who represent the elite in these countries are they actually presenting a way forward to end the war, which they are not. I mean, it's important that they're saying these things, but as long as they remain tied to the interests of the elite, whether it is in the Middle East or in the West, ultimately they are not going to present a way forward. So in other words, they are correct and it's they are correct to criticize the Israeli state. And it is important that they're doing that. And it's important for us to acknowledge the pressures that ref they, they reflect pressures on them when they make those statements. But ultimately, we cannot have illusions in them. They are capitalist politicians who are acting under pressure from the mass anger. And in fact, let's not also forget that these regimes also preside over a really uh, vicious kind of status quo against the poor and against working people, against unions, against working mm -hmm. class organizing. So ultimately, um, all of this should be seen, in my view, to the lens of the pressure from the anti-war protests internationally. And uh, what I would say is that all of this shows that protests do make a difference and we need to ramp them up. We need a much stronger and wider global anti-war protest movement against the war on the Palestinians and build build that on working class solidarity that cuts across ethnic 
and nationalist lines, which obviously has to include Palestinian people, other Arabs, working class people in the US and elsewhere, and of course, all the Jewish working people who, are, who have been speaking out against the war and more of them uh, again. And I, I, if I might just add one point, uh, and uh, hopefully we can talk more about this, is that in the US, it's because it's an example of you know whom we should have illusions and in whom we should not you know so i'm just trying to give a more sort of close to home exact closer to home example which is that um we saw uh the unions like ufcw and aft my union in washington state endorse the uncommitted campaign in washington state and washington state got uh, you know, I mean, it's a blue state. There's no illusions that Biden won't win the state. And which is why it's important that uh, it's not, it wasn't driven, the, the support for uncommitted from the rank and file in Washington state wasn't driven by some sort of uh, illusions in calculations about the election. It was it was much more beyond that, you know, it was sort of a principled objection to the war, anger at Biden. That's why it's important. And it was over 89,000 people voted in Washington in a very blue state. That's very important to note. Um, and so all of that rank and file pressure forced big unions like UFCW and AFT to endorse it. But these are unions that the leadership of both these unions has already endorsed Biden months ago. And uh, I don't believe that they had any real democratic debate or discussion among their rank and file membership to decide whom, which candidate to endorse for, endorse. And it's not like after they supported uncommitted, they said, we've changed our mind. We rescind the endorsement and we're going to have a rank and file discussion and debate about whom to endorse. There's no such thing. So in other words, I think uh, it's important that they supported that because it shows the pressure on them, just like we see some of these Middle Eastern or South African leaders do, taking some steps. But at the end of the day, how far are they going or not going? Re that's much more revealing of what, whether we should have illusions in them as well. And same thing with uh, the UAW leadership. It is very important that they uh, passed the ceasefire resolution, but then they turned around and endorsed Biden. This kind of double speak keeps stymieing the anti-war movement. And that's why I'm insisting that we should be very clear and separate out the rank and file anger internationally from the sort of heads of state kind of uh, statements. Because unless we do that, the anti-war movement will keep having illusions in the wrong people and the wrong entities. Uh, and, that, and that's a that's a great segue into what, I mean, it feels like you, you already know the outline of the show because you are literally giving great introductions to the next section of this. And more broadly, you know, the broader topic of this stream is no more sellouts. And we're, we're, we're going to sort of more dive towards, towards that. Cause I wanted to, to sort of outline the show where we talk about why it's so important. Like one of the issues that makes this so important is what's happening in Palestine. This just crystallized why we have to eliminate these self-inflicted, you know, errors, these self-inflicted wounds by teaming up with sellouts. And this article I saw on uh, uh, Socialist Alternative, I, I do want to get into a little bit of that and talking about um, the uncommitted campaign. But first, let me play this video um, from On Strike, your your um, uh, podcast, this video clip that I saw that kind of talks about it. So let's move into the resistance. So some of the part of the resistance, you have people like us that I would say are a lot more uh, radical, but then you have campaigns like the Abandoned Biden campaign, um, which is talking about not voting for Biden in November. That was the first sort of campaign that that was talking about this and they were they already went national then the uncommitted campaign um came in and did some you know it was a good campaign i must say it is a more um it is a campaign whose goal isn't as radical as the abandoned biden uh a campaign but they still um has have the uh potential to be from my, just from my like, point of view, go, go ahead, Nick. If you just want. real quick, from my point of view, yeah, they the the rank and file, like like Shama says, of that movement is dead serious. But then you have the professional managerial class 
that are trying their best to hijack it and bring it back to the Democratic Party. And I don't think they're going to be successful with it. I mean, and, and, and time, will prove like me be, time will prove me correct or incorrect on that assessment. But I think people are mischaracterizing uh, this movement because I do think it's a positive movement. Just because the PMCs are trying to hijack it don't mean it, be, it will be successful. And I'm just saying this out anecdotally because I'm talking to a lot of people on the ground. They're like, yeah, nigga, this shit they talking about, but I was Mike voting for Biden, not happening. <laughs> so I am saying that anecdotally from what I hear I'm you. Talking. So anyway, that's I hear you. that is a great point. That's a great point to insert. Let's play the video and then we'll get more comment after this. Here in the Washington primary and in other cities across the country, Worker Strike Back members organized using a petition in support of the uncommitted movement, calling for a new party for working people and a vote for the strongest independent left candidate in November. We talked to many people who had already voted uncommitted or who agreed to do so. I feel, I feel anxious about the election. I feel demoralized about the prospects of having either of them as president again. I guess I just vote for one more just because I dislike the one the most. So it's not like either one is good. It's tough, you know, like four years ago, eight years ago, it was kind of like the same thing. Choosing the lesser of two evils in, in a way is very tiring to try to choose the lesser of two evils every four years i think a third party would be good because it's like you have to worry about republicans and then you know you have to also worry about a liberal uh president that you know was kind of like saying i will help you people and then like you know with what's happening with gaza like kind of turning his back they don't understand how we live so and i don't think that they ever will and they don't really care and i think like that has never been clearer than like you know to see not old men running against each other, one of whom is like slightly more virulently racist than the other one, um, both of whom are like, you know, foaming at the mouth to do more genocide. Before I had difficulty with like accepting that reality, but now I feel like I'm past that point where I don't think I could check either box and go to bed at night feeling like I did my part. And make sure you check out on uh, Strike uh, uh, Shama Sawant's podcast on YouTube. Make sure I got a, I got a couple of more clips later on the show to to also go over. I wanted to play that before, of course, pivoting to you and asking like, what is your general take of the uncommitted campaign? What they've accomplished? What their potential uh, uh, can be? And what is the next step? Like, is is this it or should this be it? I, I, I You kind of alluded to it already, but if you could kind of go into more detail with those and, and address those questions. Yeah, I, I think this is very important. It is an important development. I really agree with uh, Nick that at the end of the day, the fact that the uncommitted campaign is getting such support, so much support in state after state is a very positive development. Obviously, seeing... Uh, it from the context of what has happened so far is also important. So I just let me just start from there. I mean, we're seeing uncommitted happen at a time when uh, the working class of America, young people in America, have seen a Trump regime, a Biden regime. And then what they have seen also is how the Democratic Party absolutely um, just went after Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And as socialist alternative and you and many others uh, on the left had predicted that the Democratic Party would not stand for any campaign or candidate that represents the interests of the working class versus the interests of Wall Street. And, uh, and at the same time, we have seen the squad appear as a, a potential of shift from politics as usual. And there was a huge excitement around it, uh, the election of AOC and others. And then we've seen them unfortunately betray the interests of working people again and again. And we've also seen the failure for the most part of uh, projects like the DSA. I mean, DSA experienced a huge burst of membership, but then since then, Partly because of the, you know, the 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 positions taken by the elected leadership of DSA themselves, and also because of the positions that DSA as a whole has taken towards the squad, not calling them out when they sold out, whether it was the Jamal Bowman vote for the Iron Dome 
or for the sellout by AOC and others of railroad union workers. Uh, it, you know, we, if we don't if we don't hold these supposed leaders accountable, then what it does is it completely completely demoralizes and scatters hundreds of thousands, if not more, of ordinary people, working people who are looking for a way to fight back then get their hopes dashed against the brick wall of selling out by politicians and the other leaders. And then what happens, unfortunately, we see is a fraction, a, a, a subset of them start looking towards right wing populism, you know, right populism as a potential solution, which is, again, very dangerous. And that is a big part of what is fueling the support for Trump and the reactionary right wing or Others just get depoliticized. You know, they just feel demoralized and say, you know, I don't even want to pay attention to politics because I feel sold out. And, and you know, in, in this whole um, list of entities and organizations and individuals that engaged in the selling out of working people, let's not forget the leaders of the BLM movement as well, the women's, liberal women's organizations that failed, absolutely failed to mount any fight back against the Dobbs ruling and allowed Roe v. Wade to get dismantled, which was a historic defeat for the women's movement in the United States. So uncommitted is coming in the wake of all of that. And to me, one of the things it shows is that obviously one of the huge weaknesses is the lack of leadership on the left. And you know, most of what has emerged has unfortunately sold out. Uh, and that is a that is an overriding weakness that needs to be overcome by the left. And so in terms of sober assessments, that is probably number one. But it also shows to me that the desire of ordinary people to fight back, their clarity that this system is not working for us, the Democrats are actually not going to be on our side, and um, they are not going to... Um, ultimately uh, you know going to change their ways you know you saw uh, i appreciate you playing the clips of the street interviews that on strike did uh, to get the views of just ordinary people young people about what they think about where this is going and what they what they feel about what their choices in november all of this shows that now more than before more and more young people and working people are clear what's not working but what's missing is what can work. And I think that is where, that that was the, that was what we were trying to uh, flesh out in that episode. I hope your viewers watch it. It was all about uncommitted, what it means and so on. And I think, so in, in, in all of this context, uh, what you're noting about the leadership of abandoned Biden and uncommitted is, is important. And then sort of taking from there to the rank and file, I think it's really important that the, to note that the rank and file of, whether, whether an ordinary person who voted in the primaries, whether they consider themselves part of uncommitted or abandoned Biden, you know, regardless of which organizational label they subscribe to, the rank and file of the movement, it's important to note, is voting based on their anger. And they may not even necessarily know who the leaders of the abandoned Biden or uncommitted are, uh, or in various states, you have listened listen to Michigan, listen to Washington. I'm I, I'm I'm sure that the vast majority of people who voted uncommitted in Washington State, for example, had no idea who the leaders of listen listen to Washington are. They are voting uncommitted because that makes sense to them, because they are angry at Biden and they are also uh, expressing their anger against Trump. Uncommitted means uncommitted to anybody. You know, this is my position, uh, and it's a rejection of both parties, and that's very important. And so they don't necessarily know what the leaders of uncommitted or abandoned Biden are saying. They've heard about the general idea about uncommitted and they're voting against Biden and Trump. Uh, so I think that's another important point to note. The third point I'll make is that uh, it, it is crucial that uh, at least a section of the leadership of abandoned Biden has said that we are calling ourselves abandoned Biden because we... Um, you know, we are not going to go for Biden in November. And I think that some of them will probably stick to that, that position. But at, at the end of the day, I fear that most of the leadership of these campaigns will end up voting for Biden and end up, in, more importantly, calling for a vote for Biden uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's no solution. And, and some of them, I think, unfortunately, are already planning to do that. And some of them are uh, are, you know, I, I will admit being honest. Some of them are being honest and they're saying, I'm not breaking from Biden. This is for me. Uncommitted is 
making Biden a better candidate. Obviously, needless to say, socialist alternative workers strike back. And I do not agree with that view whatsoever. For us, this is not about making Biden better. This is about finding a way, showing a way to channel the anger and frustrations of millions of American people, um, working and young people, and say, this is the way to go. We need to break from both the Republicans and the Democrats. And in, in that, with that logic in mind, we are urging people to vote uncommitted. So the petitions that you showed you know, in the clips, those are the petitions that worker strike back activists have and socialist alternative members have been using in Seattle and some other cities where we are reaching people on that basis. We are not uh, we are not purveyors of illusions that uncommitted will somehow be enough and then you turn around and vote for Biden in November. And we are also not being blasé about the real fears that people have of Trump. You know, one of the reasons the lesser evilism keeps rearing its head every presidential year is because there isn't an alternative that people see as viable to push back against Democrats and Republicans. So uh, I, I, I think that it is that more people than before are understanding the dead end of voting for Democrats and Republicans. But uh, in November, we, we cannot, you know, those of us who are trying to lead on the left, we cannot put the burden on ordinary people and say, you know, you, again, you voted for a sellout. But for us, it's for us to see that, well, the reason that keeps happening, much less the phenomenon of Trump getting working class support, is that there are no viable options. And so that's why it is so important for us to continually connect any vote for Jill Stein or uh, Cornell West. First of all, it's important for us to call for the vote and also uh, say that this for us, this is not an end in itself because it's going to be a small vote. It's it's to build the building blocks of the uh, of a new party for working people. And from that, with that end in mind, it is important that we fight for the strongest independent left vote in November. Uh, and in that context, I'll just one last thing I'll say is that it's, uh, you know, Cornell West, unfortunately, the campaign is uh, doing a disservice, a huge disservice to working class people and the oppressed, because it's extremely disappointing to see how weak his campaign has been, and especially that that weakness continues since the uh, Gaza war broke out, because as I said earlier, genuinely Cornell West has a track record. You know, it's not like he's going to put on a, a face, you know, it's not going to, it's, it's not a pretense. He genuinely feels that, but that is not showing up in the strength of the campaign. He has not, when we conducted an interview with Cornell West on, on strike, uh, which maybe you can show a clip of that. I asked yeah, I him that. again about, you know, why aren't you holding mass rallies? When are you going to start holding mass rallies? I gave the example of Bernie Sanders who, yeah, by, by October of the previous year, meaning October of last year or October of 2015, Bernie had already had, um, I think, 100,000 people attend his rallies or something like that, or maybe even more, I can't remember. But the fact is that he was holding mass rallies in multiple cities, organized along a very clear working class program. And remember, people made the corporate media made fun of Bernie for giving the same speech everywhere. But it that's what's important. That's what you do in order to let working people know this is what you stand for. And that's why you should come and fight with us. Obviously, it was a fatal, fatal flaw that he ran as a Democrat and had illusions. And not to mention, since then, he has gone even further, really completely uh, turning the roar of his working class program into a whimper, just completely selling out to Clinton and then to Biden. And then, uh, of course, one of the most um, striking uh, failures uh, and betrayals was refusing to call for a ceasefire, you know, when, when millions were saying that he should. So all of this shows that we need a real working class alternative. And I think, honestly, in terms of uh, practical measures, it's unfortunate that um, that Cornell West is not running as a Green Party candidate. It would be much better if there was any prospect of Cornell West and Jill Stein running on the same ticket, and and then for us to to really push uh, for the left. I mean, to push for the strongest independent left candidate. The the splintering of these votes is not helping the left. It's not helping working people. It's almost like he did all the actions that would help the Democratic Party and the people that are against a uprising left wing movement. How what 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 would what would you do if you want to tank the 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 surge of left wing third party activism? I'm not saying he did it, but you would do exactly what he's doing. <laughs> what yeah, so that? Shama, if you if you didn't hadn't heard our critique of Cornell West campaign, 
everything you said, we have we also had the same critique. We do take it slightly further. Of course, we're not asking you to agree with it, but just to restate what we said, we do, and, and Nick was just alluding to it. We we there's no way um we feel like there's no way that this person could have gone through and have all the knowledge he has and make mistakes, these grave mistakes in a row. There's no way that that cannot be intentional, in my opinion. Yeah, there's I just no way. I there's there's no way that this cannot be intentional. It's just one bad decision after another. And I held um, off on that theory for a while, CJ, but after I seen enough. Yeah, I had got there. I had got there earlier. I, I must admit, I must admit, I didn't give him a shot because I, I saw I just saw it earlier. But, but anyway, we, we are gonna be talking about Cornell West, Bernie Sanders a, a little bit in a, just a second, but I do want to ask uh, talk more a little bit more about this before we move on, which is this is from Socialist Alternative website because you're you you've been and you've yeah, been talking right about this yourself. You've been talking about we need a new party. We need a new party. I'm hearing you speak that a lot more than I've heard before. And let me just read a couple of snippets from this article. It says voting uncommitted is an important vehicle to register public anger at Biden's policies, but it can only have a lasting impact if the campaign in opposition to Biden is taken up through. I think that should say through. I think that's a typo. The general um, election um, itself. So, uh, before I read on, um, what this is the question I posed to to the to the panel. What would you what would you say is the value of expressing your dissatisfaction in the primary without expressing your dissatisfaction in the general? What value? can be extracted from that in your opinion is there a value that can be extracted from that because it's it's our opinion that there's it's like it's like giving yourself credit for a dress rehearsal and then in in the actual performance you're doing something completely different so um is there a value in voting uncommitted in the primary and then voting for Biden in the general, I kind of know your answer, but if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that point. Yeah, of course. I, I'm glad you asked the question in that way, because um, let, let me start with a hypothetical. It doesn't exist, unfortunately, for working people and for the left. But had we had a really strong independent left anti-war pro working class campaign of the kind we have run in Seattle, but for the presidential election, uh, that we didn't we didn't think we didn't believe was going to win actually in the presidential election because we don't have that uh, prediction that it would win. But we but had we had a strong enough campaign where we knew that it was actually going to galvanize the attention of millions of Americans and that uh, if we had uh, the campaign like that you know go on through November and if we had actual concrete strategy to use that to then launch the a new party or a new some some sort of new organization maybe not a party immediately you know it depends on what what support we have and all that uh, but something concrete that could be launched coming out of the november election if that were the case then we would not be asking this question right we would we would be voting for that candidate in the primaries in as many ballots and we would fight to get them as many uh, for example, we, we would fight to, sorry, I'm sort of mixing the two primaries in November, for an independent left candidate, most likely the scenario would have been that we would fight to get them on the ballot as many in, in as many states as possible in November. And in the primaries, most likely the strategy we would have had is of a write-in campaign. And it would have been hard, but it would have been worth fighting for. I mean, I don't know if some of your viewers might know that in 2021, I was facing a recall effort from the Chamber of Commerce and from the Democratic Party. And we prevailed against that recall. But we we had to, the campaign strategy, campaign had to have a strategy to deal with this complication where we're telling people to vote against the recall because there wasn't, it, it wasn't like my name on the ballot. It was recall Shama Sawant, yes or no. And 
that presents presents campaigning uh, challenges but you have to overcome them by having a very strong organizing very strong political basis for the campaign and it can be done so had we had such an independent left campaign that was really strong really galvanizing around a uh, uh, a strong set of political demands economic demands and so on anti war we would have called for a um, right in vote in the primary and then we would have begun uh, planning for the general election now i'm saying that because precisely because we don't have that and what in the absence of that what we have is the uncommitted effort and i like i said i don't have illusions in the leadership uh, of, of the campaigns I and mean, as i said i i'll commend them if they do stick to the the idea of not voting for biden and uh, supporting jill stein or connell west i have spoken to a couple of activists who said that they would but they are more rank and file activists i'm not spoken to the leadership i i would like to but i haven't been able to reach them uh but for the most part i expect that they won't and uh in fact uh, about the abandoned biden leaders have said that they won't support biden un unless there's a ceasefire and you have to read between the lines i think what it genuinely means i don't i i'm not, I'm not talking about the intent of those those activists but ultimately what it means is that if there's any sort of temporary ceasefire or even if biden just talks about ceasefire i expect mm -hmm. that they will use their authority to pressure people to vote for biden so i'm more interested and we should all be more interested in what the rank and file who are voting uncommitted think and beyond that all the millions of people and this goes to your point cj the millions of working and young people who didn't vote in the primaries who weren't going to vote in the primaries but are interested in having a channel for their anger against biden and trump and so our interest in in the uncommitted effort is along those lines where we want to push for our interest in pushing for the largest possible uncommitted vote is because we want to push towards that but we are doing that while recognizing that unfortunately given where things are uh uncommitted is a limited expression it is a lim very limited expression we want to use that to build the working class movement the movement for a new party and to build the socialist movement in the united states and uh and that's our you know ultimately that's what our goal we want to build the socialist movement this year the presidential election is the main political discussion with which uh most working class people are tune into and we need to orient towards it in the most effective way see the the best and only way of building a working class movement of building a socialist movement is not by standing on the sidelines but also not by cheerleading weak movements you know so for example we are not among those uh, activists uh, who activist leaders for example some of whom write for jacobin and other publications who just mm -hmm. cheerlead uh the labor leadership uncritically or the cheerlead uh efforts yeah. like uncommitted uncritically we're not doing that we're being very honest with people and saying that this is a limited effort but ultimately we need to channel this towards an effective fight back this year against the trump and biden type of uh options also not having illusions in rfk and point the fight towards working class and socialist politics you know we are not going to win a socialist revolution by Uh, as we all know by standing on a street corner and saying one solution revolution that's why we are having this serious conversation which i appreciate and so for us it's the question of how do we build our forces by orienting to important uh, but very imperfect developments like uncommitted that's that's the question you know, i i 100% agree with what you're saying because i just explained earlier how the professional managerial class cuz i was listening to the whole thing i had some, some stuff going on in the background but the professional managerial class is trying to hijack the uncommitted vote so as revolutionary shouldn't we try to do the same even if yes. you see the pnc <laughs> class trying to bring them back to a democrat party does this serve us to try to be the counter balance to that so it's like shama said it's it's important to be clear about the limits of this tactic but we can use this tactic as a way to bring people to more revolutionary mi uh, mind minded way of thinking and that's kind of the conclusion i came up with this especially seeing how this is catching like wildfire and not only just the uh, arab uh, american communities you got black and latino communities that fall in suit uh so mm -hmm. it's nothing but a positive thing and only represent uh the potential the revolutionary potential of the proletariat right now but go ahead cj 
Yeah, and generally just read the, sec the second part, and then I'm going to bring up a video here. All working class and oppressed people who have been left out to dry by the Democratic Party I think should Shama unite was, under... Yeah, sorry, I think Shama wants to chime in. So, sorry, sir. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Shama. Me? I'm sorry. I couldn't see you. Oh, no, no, no. I, I just uh, messaged you about it. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, what you're about to talk about is important, CJ. I just wanted to say that in terms of you know oh, what ahead. we were saying just now and what Nick was saying about what is our uh, role, those of us who are genuinely... Uh, have the understanding that we need a socialist revolution. We understand that capitalism cannot be fixed. We need a socialist revolution, but, when that, but, but that we're not going to get there by standing on the sidelines. We have to connect with actual working people who are angry. And I think one aspect of this that should be pointed out, we, we all know this, but you know, in terms of having a discussion that informs your viewership also, is that one uh, serious um, um, uh, failure of the socialist left would be is if we left the field to the misleaders you know so on the one hand we believe that cheerleaders the uncritical cheerleaders are huge doing a huge disservice and some of them are actually doing that deeply cynically looking out for their own careers looking out for just uh, you know the, to not be adversarial towards powerful people that is part of what explains the fact that aoc has been able to sell out again and again because there is a whole uh, machinery that gives her cover uh, and uh, we don't want any part of that. But we also don't want, in the name of sort of being purist or something like that, to leave the field to the misleaders. So if we weren't there talking about what uncommitted means, that it represents the anger of ordinary people and where it needs to go, then it won't go there. There's no prospect of that going there because the field is left uninterrupted for the people who intend to ultimately they uh, lead everyone back to Biden and the Democratic Party. So we are the only voices against it, helping people understand that they don't have to make that choice. Uh, and if we didn't do that, imagine, uh, you know, what a huge dis disservice we would be doing. It would be a dereliction of political duty on our part. That's actually something Nick and I and all of us really say, because we hear the critiques. You guys you know, every they say you guys seem to always have a, an analysis, a critique about everything that comes out. John Fetterman, this and that. It was like, yes, because we need to be very honest with uh, the workers. And that was something that Nick made as his top goal this year. Remember, Nick, he was like, yeah. this year, yeah, we have to be crystal clear Clarity. with workers. No illusions no whatsoever. Not right. And. Uh, just to uh, seal this uh, segment up, I'll read this last part. All working class and oppressed people who have been left out to drive for the Democratic Party should unite under uncommitted and abandoned uh, Biden banners and begin constructing a working class political alternative to the rotten two party system or uh, parties of war. An important step in this process will be mobilizing as many people as possible to protest the Democratic National Convention this summer and using those protests as launching pads for the conference to find a new anti-war pro-worker party. I wanted to make sure I include that because we're one of the team, we're one of the people in our community, Shama, that is, we're, we're, we're planning to raise money to, to send RBN members out to Chicago for exactly what this article uh, ends up saying here. Um, and- Yeah, we definitely um, will be there. Yeah, and, and to your other point that you were just mentioning about, you were essentially saying we can't be um, out of the game. We can't be sitting on the sidelines and letting these, you know, these pseudo left, the the Ryan Grimm's, for example, of the world's be the mouthpieces for this. We need to be in the room. We need to be at the table speaking. And you speak about it uh, quite uh, clearly no, here no. as we pivot to, um sellouts now the way i have it set up is the third party stuff is later even though we we all have been itching to talk about it because i want to use the third party segment as the solution part to what we're talking about so we're talking about the sellouts first and then we're going to end up talking about the solution part which is third parties um talk about the candidates and also talk about a vision for a new party in the future but let's listen to shama with the last time she was on this is a classic uh clip here What's my old so place? The other part of the story is all the Ryan Grimm's of this world. We have to be very clear. They are cynical purveyors. They are snake oil salesmen who are 
very consciously peddling the Democratic Party support. And you know, I think on uh, Twitter, some people are tweeting like, "Hey, are you a masochist? Why are you going towards Ryan Grimm? Why are you going to these podcasts if you know that uh, you're you're not going to get any agreement on these things?" But we have to be clear. He's not. He's not doing some engaging in some self sacrifice, and it is not about him. It's about people like him. People like him are determinedly peddling this line, even more so now because the democratic establishment recognizes that this is very clear as a betrayal in the eyes of hundreds of thousands, of unconvinced, and perhaps even millions of workers. That now, if you remember, this was uh, right around the breaking of the rail strike and Ryan was trying to convince people that somehow it was part of the plan. And what? Yeah. And I think even at that time, I was saying something very similar to this, which is the last 12 to 24 months have been have crystallized the notion that the working class people really don't have anybody in the inside, we really don't have anybody working for us. Progressive Democrats have moved considerably uh, and noticeably to the right, uh, voting to break a strike and and running cover for the reactionary murderous uh, Biden administration. Elected pro uh, progressives have really shown their cards. They've shown when having to make a choice between progressive policies and establishment policies, they will pick establishment policies or the status quo um all the time so 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 just broadly speaking um what is the way to sort of um diminish diminish the effects of of said sellouts that are embedded everywhere in a movement that's trying to get off the ground and in a lot of ways they are the impediment they are the ones that diffuses excitement. They are the ones that, um, you know, lead the movement down a rabbit hole with some some bogus stories. So how do we, how do we rise above that? How do we, you know, how do we maneuver through something like that? Yeah, I think that's a very important question you asked. That how do how do we how do we uh, overcome them? And just to start with. I don't think that we can uh, we can just remove them in the sense that this is capitalism, unless and until humanity, you know, working class, led by working class people, succeeds in ending capitalism, overthrowing capitalism, and ushering in socialism. Uh, that these sellouts are going to be all over the place. There is no prospect of building a movement, and in fact, much less a revolutionary movement for socialism uh, without these sellouts around every corner. You better believe it. They are going to be there because that is the nature of this system. It, you know, the system's injustice and its absurdity, not to mention now the environmental and climate crisis, it points people towards the need to overthrow capitalism, and then it generates revolutionaries like some of us, uh, but and also uh, propels mass layers to fight back. But the system also has its own corruption, and it 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 fuels the creation of these kinds of sellouts. So uh, there's always going to be a Ryan Grimm. There's always going to be a Pramila Jayapal. There's going to always going to be an AOC. The question is, uh, how do we? You know, as long as we are fighting on the basis of you know in, in the context of capitalism is what I mean. Uh, then the question is, how do we expose them? How do we defeat them? And how do we win victories despite the fact that they're around? I mean, and, and I'll tell you, even if we succeed and we, we better succeed in it, because this is crucial, it's a crucial step, building a new party for working people, we should expect that some of these progressives in the Democratic Party, they if, if they see this project succeeding, some of them will jump ship and come and join this party, but not to actually build it. They will they will uh, arrive as cynical elements, and then they will uh, become the right wing of that party. So it's not like it's going to be just a, a, a but a good, yeah. We're not going to coast to victory. Point. Every step of the way is going to be a fight. So we have to yeah. sign up if we want if we want to overthrow capitalism and f fight for a socialist society. Then. It has to be, you have to sign up for relentless fight back, especially those of us 
who are playing a leadership role, more is demanded of us. And so when I ran for office, I was not, and, and obviously my organization, Socialist Alternative, we were not, we did not run for office to reform the system. We ran for office to expose it. We, we had no idea that I was going to get elected and I, I was going to agree with some of the things that Democrats were saying and then not agree with some of them just to get some sort of victory for working people within the system. And they're my colleagues. I was told many times, they're your colleagues. Why aren't you being nice to them? You know, stuff like that. But we were crystal clear. And if you're not, it's the downfall of the working class that we are not there to make even a limited peace with them. No, we are there to expose the system and expose yeah, the people who represent that, that system. <laughs> and, and every step we take, even the, you know, we, we obviously we don't have any illusion that we're going to build a socialist Seattle or anything like that, or, or build socialism through running for office, running one candidate for office. We don't have such illusion. But for that whole decade that I was in office, at every moment, our objective ultimately is to build the revolutionary socialist movement so i ran for office as a bolshevik that was my clear understanding uh, and we didn't win the victories we win accidentally we won them because we are bolsheviks and socialist alternative and we were very clear that we are revolutionaries and we approach every task including elected office as a revolutionary and so this is the one of the most important things for us to understand if you want to diminish the effects of the sellout that are embedded, as you said, CJ, that was yeah. the question. Uh, and I'll just give you a concrete example. You know, in it, it, like I said, it was never an e there was never one day that was easy or uh, one where well, there was one day when all the Democrats were at peace with us. No, they were at absolute war with us because they're representing the capitalist interest and they were clear we are anti-capitalist in we are representing anti-capitalist interests they understood that very clearly they understood i was a marxist so there was no peace between us and it was a mutual mutually agreed uh you know battle lines were drawn but the reason we won despite having just one position among nine is that we built the base for working people to fight back. We forced the union leadership of some of the unions that didn't agree with us because their rank and file were supporting us. We also fortunately had one or two left union leaders who supported us uh, on their own basis. And it was that kind of mass organizing that helped us win victories. And because of that, ultimately what happened, you know, is that uh, I mean, the city council has always been Democrat, as far as I know, because it, the consciousness of ordinary people in Seattle is well to the left of the po politician. Yeah. So the D, well, I mean, it's always Democrats. But what did change is that we, because of the way we organized and won, we drove out the most overtly uh, corporate chamber of commerce type of mouthpieces that we had on the city council. And... Uh, one after one after one, we drove them out. You know, they went and found alternate careers because it was no longer a cushy job, which gave them a six figure salary while hobnobbing over wine and cheese with the Chamber of Commerce. They, yeah, they that's right. This is not easy no more, man. This yeah, is, it, I thought was going to steal, no man. It was easy no more. And, and not only was it not easy, they were That's exposed to hundreds of people coming to City Hall and calling them out, saying, you're a sellout. How dare you say that a worker at McDonald's should go and get a second job because she's so poor, she can't even buy small trinkets for her child. And I'm not making this up. This 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 example actually happened in City Hall with this guy, the city council member telling her, can't you get a second job? This woman is the black working class woman from McDonald's sitting there tearfully saying she's so poor, she can't buy little trinkets for her child. And this guy says that, I remember that with so much anger, the anger never goes away. But my point is that because we succeeded on a mass, you know, sort of organizing basis, one after one, there was an exodus of these chamber of commerce type mouthpieces and the Democratic Party was forced to contend with our setting of the political agenda and they were forced to run progressives. And I'm saying progressives and I'm doing air quotes, but it's important to understand. <laughs> I mean, I don't want illusions in them, but 
we also have to recognize it it, sh it demonstrates the pressure on the democrats to weed out their chamber of commerce people and bring in the so called progressives because they were under you know they had to show that they were progressive they they keep saying they're progressive but they're not they were for, they were exposed and so exposing them is what what is needed uh, it, we cannot leave uh, working class people to be uh, to be, you know, we cannot leave working class people's fate to the capitalist politicians. We have to always challenge them. And the Bolsheviks did that in Russia. You know, in, in, as a matter of fact, they had multiple representatives in the Russian parliament, which was called the Duma. And Lenin actually worked very closely with those elected to the Duma because he saw the central importance of that work. And in fact, Karl Marx himself made this very clear that the working class cannot be abstentionist. That it would be a massive mistake, but it's a question of how you, what does it look like for revolutionary leadership to be in the halls of capitalist power? Th that has to be, um, you know, it has to be, um, we have to be unbending is what I'm trying to say. We have to be unbending on that understanding. There cannot be a few days where you're revolutionary in a few days and the rest of the, the time you're not. No, being a revolutionary means always being in uh, an adversarial position from the representatives of the capitalist system but it also means not abstaining and it, it, so it means I'm, getting bolsheviks elected but also having a fundamentally different approach sorry i went on i'm sure that was, nick that was might want to chime in after the rant. no go ahead, go ahead cj i do want to chime in but you can go ahead first. no i'm saying i'm sure fantastic. both of us want to rant here because or, or at least say something not rant but say something because the reason we're both sort of chuckling, I would assume it's the same reason you can say if it's not, is that we are in, in this space, we have to deal where we feel like we're always pulling people. Come on, let's go to the yeah. left. Let's go. Come on. It's so refreshing to be in conversation with somebody that's like, no, put the foot on the gas. Let's keep going. Let's, it's so refreshing to be in conversation with you and a person who has that same mindset as like this. There's yeah, no, we don't have to drag. Like, no, there's none of that. But go ahead, Nick. I know you wanted to. That's to my point. Like, about it been, yeah. I'm, I've been, and I've been talking about it publicly the frustration I felt ever since I've been in this space. Like the nonstop gaslighting by the professional managerial class, the nonstop tone policing. Like, you, you guys know, like the 90% of the criticism I get is not based on positions I take, not based on, on the coverage I do, not based on what I cover. It's it's been toned from day one. It always came from the professional managerial class. And CJ, you got it all the time as well. What's the number one criticism people had at RBN? Why you guys keep going after these motherfuckers, man? Come on, aren't they the best of the best? Why you guys keep calling out the Ryan Grimm, the Bernie Sanders, and all these people? And they viewed us as being like this, oh man, they just want to talk shit for clicks. They don't understand that we can't allow these charlatans to spread their lives freely. We need to view them as adversarial. In RBN, we were the first channel. Well, I wouldn't say first, I wouldn't say first, but we was a very prominent channel that came out. And we was like, no, we're not doing this thing where we typically criticizing you. Like, oh, we think you good on this. No, we coming out and treating you the same way we would treat someone we are adversarial to because we are. And Ryan Grimm was one of the many people. David Sharoda was another like golden goose that couldn't be touched. And then we started going after David Schroeder. People were like, oh my God, because people wasn't used to that. And we told people no. So I love the the fact that you said we should be adversary. We should be calling these people out. Because look at what Ryan Grimm is doing. People want me to give these people a cookie. You're against a genocide and you want a fucking cookie because you're against a genocide. No, Ryan Grimm, despite his good Gaza coverage, once again, Crystal, Gaza coverage, good. It's easy to get that right, fam. We, we what are we talking about? It's easy to get that right. Look at this, AOC after refusing, and I'm interjecting this. I apologize, CJ, because this is based on no, no, yeah, yeah. After right along AOC after. Was called out by the working class because she refused to call what's going on in Gaza a genocide, and now she pretends, well, well, I don't. It's just terms and labels. That was what Bernie and AOC was saying. All of the terms. No, there's a reason why they wasn't saying that because it implicates Biden. It's not like an innocent mistake. So AOC took so much pressure that six months after the genocide, now we're in a famine, fam. 100,000 dead. Now she finally said the word genocide. And look who, look who was here to praise AOC, Shama. I know that was a long prefix to this. But you guys see what this guy is here for? 
He says, after a slow start, that's one hell of a way to put it. After a slow start, AOC has become one of the most forceful voices. You guys see how they're here to confuse, to elevate AOC instead of the working class people that was in the street risking police violence? So anyway, I'll bring this up. You guys can comment on it if you want. I just want to interject this. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, let me, let me, because this is actually part, it was later on, but we can interject it here because okay. it fits because um, what I wanted to, what, what my comment was on this is that you notice how these social Democrats, they're fine with sort of pairing genocide to famine. They're not fine with pairing genocide with deaths by bombs because they're complicit in their own minds with that, with their votes. So, and I noticed this because I noticed when, I forget what other progressive was talking about it, they kept talking about the famine, which is true, but it's just curious to me that that's where they feel comfortable um, saying you're starving people and not necessarily the military action that brought, you know, 30, 40,000 plus uh, uh, deaths. Um, but my, to, to pivot sort of to stay on ALC and ask the final question on this, and then we're going to go to third party stuff in the last sort of 30, 40 minutes that we have you here. Um, let me bring this up here. And just to get your general sort of either understanding and in an our in analysis of the news of ALC and Sanders unveil Green New Deal for housing. And just to understand, this is a reintroducing. And this is something they do every year. And I call it their off season. That's when they <laughs> want to bring up all these bills. <laughs> like when the yeah. season is over, if you're in any sport, it doesn't matter. Like your season is over. And then the person want to go and run the, the most laps and be like, what, what, what does this do? What does this do? You get what I'm saying? So this is what they do. And this is how the sellouts, um, Shama, this is how they keep their audience engaged. They have to, at some point, come out with policy and talk about policy that presumably presumably, their audience um, believes, the people that follow them uh, agrees with. So they throw these bait out. But you notice they don't never, they never or rarely come up with all of this legislation when they're in power. The Ro Khanna's, the Pramila Jayapal's, the AOC's, the Bernie Sanders, since, since um, they've lost the house, They've introduced well over 15 bills combined, well over. But when they had the House, crickets. So uh, uh, just broadly, because I don't want to have to go into the article, but broadly speaking, you know, not the policy, because I agree with the policy. A Green New Deal for housing would be great. A real Green New Deal for housing would be great. But the, what, I'm, what I'm asking you about is their use of this topic, their use of the Green New Deal for housing in order to keep people invested in their their charlatan game. Could you speak to that part, uh, Shama? I think there is a lot to be said about what you're saying. These are, um, I mean, even if we uh, even if we were to assume way, we don't know in any given case what, what motives are driving them. I think if you look overall at the way the Democratic Party operates, you see this type of theme as exactly like you're saying, they, in order to deflect when there is pressure on them. See, when there's no pressure on them, they're not even bothering to look a certain progressive. You know, they, they're doing what they're doing, which is their normal way of functioning, which is generally uttering a few progressive things, but, but mostly very um, comfortably doing the bidding of Wall Street. And obviously in this case, uh, the interests of imp US imperialism. But when they are under pressure, they resort to all kinds of tactics. And one of the tactics is the tactic of deflection by uh, trying to deflect attention away from the most important issue of the day to then saying, oh, we're going to do new Green New Deal. Well, what stopped you from fighting for the Green New Deal type of housing from day one? You know, why is it that you're talking about it now and you're talking about it, but what are you actually going to do to fight to win it? Those are also the questions. I mean, it's, it's not like, it's not like, these demo, these progressive Democrats or the, even the squad members, it's not like you can say, well, you know, they're very weak on this issue <coughs> on war and imperialism. It's unforgivable that they didn't stand up against the war. However, they have been absolute fighters for housing for working people in America. It's not like that. You know, it's not like 
th these issues operate in silos, uh, sort of um, in isolation from one an another in their minds. Ultimately, being anti-war, being against U.S. imperialism, uh, being uh, in favor of taxes on billionaires, for example, to fund various needs, being in, in favor of Medicare for all. These are not isolated positions. How, uh, how you stand on any of those positions it is going to be revealing of how you stand on all of them. You know, so uh, we have to, it's, it's important, I agree, to draw out the cynicism in this where there's a lot of pressure on her in relation to the war, but then uh, she, um, you know, she fails on that and then she ends up saying something like this, where I think the question we should ask is, okay, this is great, but what are you actually going to do to fight to win it? I mean, sloganeering is fine, introducing bills are fine. And do you know how many bills are introduced? in Congress? Do you know how many bills are introduced by Democrats in state legislatures? Countless, but not even a fraction of it is actually won because this is the way, they, this is the gimmickry they engage in. They put forward bills, present no strategy for fighting back, uh, let alone organizing on a mass basis, which is the only thing that they can do actually to win something. They have no obligation of any uh, of that kind. So it's not only the tactics of deflection, it's also what do, what are they doing in these in this supposed perpetrated issue that they claim that they're going to uh, bring forward and let's not for one second for, forget her record regarding gaza and, and and the record of bernie sanders you know they aoc attacked the protest movement last fall and she abstained on the iron dome and she's been very weak on all these issues and that is on top of as i said these are not isolated issues she's been uh, she's she has betrayed on many fronts and she has not really led on any building a movement on any of these whether it's medicare for all or the fight against the war on gaza so it's you know it's all of that yeah and, 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 and the, the reason the reason oh, it's all of that and not just one thing is because any of that if you are going to fight for any of that it would immediately make you enemy number one of the democratic establishment of the uh, the the ruling class as a whole, the capitalism as a whole, and that is why I keep going back to this point about what kind of elected representatives do we need? What kind of fight back do we need? It has to be on a Marxist basis. In other words, what we want is Marxism, not Bernieism. Ah, oh, exactly. Oh, we need that on the shirt. <laughs> that is that is absolutely <laughs> a spot on. And again, it's just so refreshing to have someone speaking along the lines that we've anyway let me play this video so this is bernie sanders now think about the movement bernie sanders had back in 2015 and all of us were involved in it either you know online or wanted to participate but shama was at a couple of the events they were there and nick was 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 canvassing at that time now shama may have been there con uh, conscious wise would you think Bernie Sanders would actually lie to Bernie Nation? And that's what he's doing in this interview. Um, let's listen. This actually is less than 90 seconds. Let's listen to this and then we'll comment. Here, can you in good conscience ask your supporters to vote for Mr. Biden? So the question is, can you, Bernie Sanders, in good conscience ask your own supporters, Bernie Nation, to support the guy that's funding the genocide, the guy that's supporting the genocide, the guy that's uh, with all of his neoliberal policies and all of his imperialism around the world. Let's listen to Bernie Sanders lie to his Bernie nation. Here, can you in good conscience ask your supporters to vote for Mr. Biden? Well, look, the contrast that I think President Biden made very clear in the State of the Union address if you believe that climate change is real, oh, Jesus. you got to vote for President Biden. If you believe that women have a right to control their own bodies, you got to vote for President Biden. If you think that at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, you don't give trillions of dollars in tax breaks to the one percent, you've got to vote for Biden. If you want to now, I must stop here. This this list that he's going over, you notice. None of those things by voting for Biden you're going to get. 
<laughs> he carefully words it though. I'm gonna rewind it. He carefully words it to where it's not necessarily promising you're gonna get those things. So let's listen again. The contrast that I think President Biden made is very clear in the State of the Union address. If you believe that climate change is real, <laughs> you gotta vote for President Biden. He said, if you believe climate change is real, not that anything's gonna be done on it. But if you think it's <laughs> that's a, a thing, good point, CJ. You see that? Now let's go to the next one. If you believe that women have a right to control their own if you bodies, believe that's a good point, CJ. I didn't catch that. Biden. If you believe it, he's <laughs> not going to say that Democrats are gonna do anything, and he just goes on with this sort of phrasing where it is so dis it is so dishonest. It is so dishonest to do this, to say this to, um, you know, pr people like us, we're involved in this every day where you catch this. But the average person, my mom, would not catch this. She would just go, oh, Biden is going to do something on that. He's going to do something on this. So, OK, this is where we're saying we have to be very honest with workers. And this is where Bernie's not being honest. With workers, and I'll let it finish out, and then I'll, I'll let you uh, uh, chime in, uh, Shama, before we get to the third party segment, which is the next segment up. If you think that at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, you don't give trillions of dollars in tax breaks to the one percent, you've got to vote for Biden. If you want to lower the cost of prescription <laughs> drugs, you got to vote for Biden. If you believe in democracy and involving people in the process rather than keeping people from voting, you have to vote for Biden. So you're saying so progressives need to put this aside? Even she got tired of hearing I'm it. Saying we've got to come, not put it aside. The fight continues to change Biden's policy in Gaza, but it, the contrast between Biden uh, and Trump is day and night. Uh, the election of Trump would be a disaster for this country and in my view the world we've got to come It's almost like a genocide would happen Biden but at the same time <laughs> we have to demand that we have a progressive agenda where we have an economy that works for all not just the few So you're standing by your endorsement of Mr. Biden's election despite the current well, policy No I CJ Sharma CJ So Shama. she was trying to she was trying to get him to commit she was trying to get him to commit to saying, hey, so you're picking uh, our democracy over genocide. That's basically what she was trying to do. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry. Uh, he said it would be a tragedy if Trump wins like a genocide or a famine happening. Something like that. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, Shama. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what he's doing is there's a lot to be said about this. I'm glad you're playing this clip because what he's doing is playing on people's genuine fears, working people's genuine fears, correctly so, of a Trump regime. And I think our starting point, obviously, as, as we've already said lots of things in this show, we, for us to be able to, for us as socialists, as Marxists, to be able to lead effectively, we have to, uh, we, we cannot brush aside the real fears that people have because that's based on reality. People have seen what uh, the what what four years of Trumpism have done and Trumpism has only grown. But what we so obviously we are not brushing aside those fears because the growth of the right wing is dangerous. And in fact, let, and let's not forget, Trump has not only promised further blatant attacks on all kinds of communities, oppressed communities, including on unions. He's also uh, said that, you know, I think he did, I, I can't, uh, I don't have the exact quote, but something like I'm going to go after every uh, imported communist and homegrown communist, you know, so yeah, in other words, it's, it's, it's very, it's dangerously antagonistic to the interests of working class people and of the growth of the left to have any feeling that somehow, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. It doesn't matter who Trump, whether it's Trump or Biden. So we are not brushing aside those fears, but the way we deal with them is by saying that the Democrats are the best builders, have been the best builders of Trumpism. And so if you want to end Trumpism, then you have to have, we have to build around a strategy for a new party for working people that can actually present an alternative to the Trumps of this world, the Bidens and the RFKs and all these uh, uh, people who ultimately in represent the interests of the billionaire class, of capitalism, of warmongering, of imperialism. And so we have to consistently and systematically point out that the Democrats have been 
the best builders of Trumpism, because without that, we cannot disentangle those two points. And that's what Bernie is refusing to do. Instead, he's going in the exact opposite direction of the spectrum, where he is doubling down on not only support for Biden and for the Democrats, but really becoming like the, like an agent of these illusions, yeah. you know. And 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 it was really good the way you pointed out, CJ, is that he is very carefully not making any promises. He's not putting any demands on the Democrats. He's not saying that. Uh, he's not even saying even in retrospect re retrospective language. He's not even using retrospective language like like uh, the I I fear that the tr Trump regime will be. Uh, deeply hostile to the interests of women. However, I also condemn the liberal organizations tied with the Democratic Party and Biden himself, who absolutely failed to fight against the Dobbs ruling and to do anything to protect Roe v. Wade in the 40 years that they were that they had promised to to protect it. That was their one job, and they failed. And so he's not even presenting a critique let of the past misdeeds of the Democratic Party, let alone putting any demands on them. He endorsed Biden within hours of Biden declaring his new campaign. And so that's why I think, you know, we have to call this out in a very, very clear way. And I think it also points to the strategy moving forward. If, if you don't mind, I just want to talk about the strategy that the socialist alternative used at that time, you know, in 2015, 2016, we did call for a Bernie, a uh, vote for Bernie. We did campaign for his uh, candidacy. But the way we did that was, in fact, very clearly, you know, he he, he hated the way we w were involved in his campaign, the way he, um, uh, I, I mean, he, he was pretty annoyed. For example, my first meeting with him was at the People's Climate March. Uh, there, was a, there was a town hall that was organized around environmental issues and climate change that evening in Manhattan. And uh, I spoke alongside him and Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein. And I was the only, obviously, speaker on, on the dais who spoke about uh, breaking from the Democrats. And I pleaded with him that he should not run as a Democrat because at, at the end of the day, they are not going to let him succeed. And so Socialist Alternative and I put forward this point that we want to fight around the kind of working class program that he was readying, but that it was um, uh, it would deal a fatal blow to that program and to working people to channel it back into the Democratic Party. And that's why uh, Socialist Alternative, you know, repeatedly pushed back against that. And I would urge. Remember, uh, Joe Biden offered and right to you, uh, Shama, but remember, no, no, Joe Biden offered her nomination to Bernie in 2016. A lot of people forget about that. Because people are like, man, what you're talking about is so important. You, you need to run outside the Democratic Party apparatus. And that's why a lot of wise people were done, like the wisest among us, was done after Bernie after 2016 when he didn't take that offer. But go ahead, Shabba, I want you to finish. Yeah, no, 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 Come thank on. you. Thank you for inserting that. It's it's true. It, 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 he he failed in that because, and it's not it's not that he, he's stupid. He, this is, this is, these are his politics. You know, he's not going to def, uh, stand against the Democratic Party. And that is why... Uh, I, I would urge people who are watching this, you know, go to socialistalternative.org and read some of the articles that we had written at that time. And also after the debacle, you know, after he uh, was um, uh, defeated, I mean, he was removed uh, from the Democratic primary, Hillary Clinton was anointed the candidate. I would urge people to go to socialistalternative.org and read some of the material that we had written at that time. We called on Bernie to run all the way to November. And in fact, the way we oriented to his campaign was not simply campaigning for him and his program. We launched, we meaning Socialist Alternative, we launched move, the movement for Bernie. That's what we call a movement for Bernie. And on that petition, we clarified all of this, that we support this program. This is what we need. But the this strategy that Bernie is offering of running as a Democrat, it, that is destined to fail. And that's why we need Bernie. We are calling on Bernie to uh, run until November. But the way we oriented that petition, CJ and Nick, is we, we never had illusions that he was going to change his mind. I mean, we would have welcomed it had he done that. Yeah, but our goal was not to convince him. Our goal was to reach a, a, a section. I mean, we are a small organization. Our goal is to was to run, reach a section of the millions of people who were excited by that program to explain to them that that is not going to work. What we need is a revolutionary socialist strategy 
to fight against capitalism. And so our movement for Bernie petition made the point that we need uh, Bernie, that we, Bernie should be called on to run all the way. And uh, it was on that basis that, we, you know, as an independent and uh, as an independent candidate, you know, that's what we called on him to do. And it was on that basis that our petition was signed by 120,000 people uh, and which is a huge thing for us, you know, for us to be calling for him to run as an independent left candidate outside of the Democratic and Republican parties and for 120,000 people to sign it. That was huge. You know, we're, we're a small organization. And the reason I'm making that point is that it is that is the very much the basis on which we ran our uh, city council office here as well for 10 years. And the starting point itself, when we ran the campaign, first campaign for city council in 2013, that from that moment itself, we had a, a, the clarity of what we need to do. And so I would say that uh, obviously we have won many, uh, many demands, many of our demands in, in Seattle, the $15 an hour, Amazon tax, just almost countless renters' rights, all of that. And each one of that has made a positive difference in the lives of working people. Even today, I run into people on the streets in the grocery stores who say that this or that policy that we won really improved the lives of themselves and their families. But even more important <coughs> than winning those uh, reforms was the was the demonstrating of what you need to win even small reforms and why uh, capitalism itself cannot be reformed. And so, you know, the need for revolutionary politics, all of that was, the, in my view, the most important thing we were able to accomplish through our decade on the city council, mo much more so even than the things that we won. Although obviously it should be clarified that revolutionaries make the best fighters and winners of reforms, precisely because we are clear about two things. One is that reforms are not enough, and we're clear about what it will take, which is an almighty fight to win any reform. And it was on that basis that actually Socialist Alternative grew fivefold uh, after we won our election. Uh, that's the biggest service, in my view, of our city council office, the growth of the socialist movement, the clarity that we have offered, and the, and the creation of more revolutionaries, because ultimately, that is the only thing we, that we will have in order to fight, much less overthrow capitalism. That's such a great point. Just real quick, and I'll pass to you, CJ. That's such a great yeah, point. Why I, don't, I don't understand reformist, because you don't get reforms without revolutionary thought processes. The people who, like, you guys are advocating for a purity test, extremes, what we should be advocating for reform, but that ideology alone doesn't lead to reforms. It doesn't lead to change. It leads to to bullshit, uh, uh, often liberal uh, policies. But anyway, CJ, I'll pass to you. That's such a great point. No, that that is such a, a great point. I do want to just briefly ask you about the UAW. You alluded to it earlier about just in general, and I think you specifically talked about some of the things at the UAW, but of course I know you know the UAW apparatus backs the war criminal in the White House. I'll briefly read the United Auto Workers endorsed President Joe Biden's re-election campaign at his National Political Action Conference in Washington, D.C. With its endorsement, the UAW bureaucracy is locking arms with the widely hated war criminal in the White House who is coordinating Israel's genocide in Gaza. The endorsement provoked opposition with protests erupting Biden's speech with chants of ceasefire now. The UAW members who included academic workers at Columbia and Northeastern uh, universities were quickly surrounded by fascistic UAW goons and Secret Service Agents who grabbed their Palestinian flags and dragged them out of the hall by their arms. While this uh, was occurring, the UAW bureaucracy repeatedly shouted UAW to drown out the voices. And let me just read, skip to this last part. The reality is that the American ruling class is waging war, a war on the on two fronts, supported by both the Democrat and Republican Party. One is to defeat. Um, its geopolitical rivals, primarily Russia and China, and subjugate the world's resources and people to global hege uh, hegemony of U.S. imperialism. The other is a class war at home to impoverish the working class and impose 
the type of austerity and authoritarian labor, dis labor discipline needed to fund the and produce the weapons for World War II. But what is your overall general uh, take on the UAW specifically endorsing Joe Biden and, and some of the things that they've said that Joe Biden has been doing for labor has just been terrible. This happening at the same time, like within the same 12 month period that he broke a rail strike is quite amazing to me. Um, but what say you about this? And then we'll get to the third party stuff. I mean, the fact that the UAW leadership endorsed Biden just right after uh, having uh, passed a ceasefire resolution really shows the limitations of, as you said, Nick, a reformist type of leadership. Uh, you know, so on the one hand, it's important to note the important developments on um, the UAW, you know, the, the victories that were won through the UAW strike. Uh, but if you, um, if you uh, watch what we are saying, and in fact, I would urge people to go and watch the on strike broadcast episode episodes actually and we did a number of episodes on the UAW strike because it was an important strike we are not unlike uh, some of the left commentators like Eric Blanc we are not uh, uncritical cheerleaders uh, we we our obligation is not towards any given leader our obligation is to the rank and file of the union and to the wider working class so we believe that it was extremely important that that strike happened and it, that it won real gains but we also feel that uh it was a mistake to have this so-called stand-up strike which was a limited type of strike and in fact if you look at the corporate media, they themselves admit that on the one hand, the strike did present a real challenge to them, which is why they were forced to concede. And that victory absolutely belongs to the union and the rank and file who picketed. And 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 Fain, Sean Fain does represent a different kind of leadership than uh, uh, many of the uh, really uh, very uh, obviously sort of, uh, um, you know, the leadership that makes much more uh, and for the for decades has made much more of a, uh, an overt um, sort of understanding with management. So in that sense, we have to recognize that that strike was very important and it won victories. But at the same time, uh, we've seen even spokespeople from corporate media admit that, well, they they felt the pressure of it and they were forced to concede that it actually did not extract the kind of price from on in, in terms of profits, you know, uh, timing the shutting down the profit machine, it wasn't able to do that kind of thing. And uh, you know, Sean Fain look uh, himself mentioned the 1930s auto workers strikes uh, many times, but it, I believe, and and that's important. But I believe that it was also a misrepresentation to liken the so-called stand-up strike, which was a limited strike, to the auto worker strike, which was an all-out strike, which was historic because it led to a you know a historic wave of unionization and and really changed the course or helped change the course of labor history in the United States. So we have to be clear about these details and we cannot just be like cheerleading all of this. Um, uh, and, and we saw similar weaknesses where it was good that they passed the ceasefire resolution, but uh, it's at the same time they turned around and endorsed. And so uh, how can we have a serious strategy to end the war when we have a whole the majority of the labor leadership refusing to break from Biden and the Democrats. You know, that is that is the problem. You cannot pass a resolution against war and then endorse the warmonger in chief, because what that does is it that throws is away. And that's what it has done. It has thrown away the massive potential leverage that these big unions could exert on Biden in the context of a closely con contested election. Imagine if the auto workers union had steadfastly refused to endorse Biden uh, and uh, in fact had uh, said that they were going to endorse a left anti-war candidate and that in Michigan they were going to form a joint sort of you know movement with the uh, the ordinary people from the Arab and Muslim community and young people as a whole who were standing against Biden to call for joint rallies, to organize, you know, to have a fighting strategy that is mapped out from now until November. Uh, in, in the absence of all of this concrete strategy, you end up seeing, you know, the you, what you see is, is a failure to present a serious threat 
to the warmongering politician. And what, what that means is that the movement, while it sees these glimmers of hope, is left treading water, you know, without a clear path forward. And so that's why, uh, you know, we need to celebrate the victories of the anti-war movement for the, from the rank and file marching on the streets. And at the same time, we have a serious obligation to uh, critique the, the limitations and failures of the leadership. And in fact, going back to your point about why, what it takes to win reforms, it takes revolutionaries to win reforms. I mean, I'm, I'm just reminded of uh, what, the words of Rosa Luxemburg on reform and revolution. You know, she, she, she it pointed out that there is a relationship between these two things necessarily, because in order to win the reforms, we need revol revolutionary politics. To, in order to win victories for these movements, we need revolutionary politics. And to win the biggest reforms, the threat of revolution needs to be real. In the wake of the Second World War, it was the real threat of revolution in Europe that led to the winning of so many social programs like socialized healthcare. Those were not, as we know, uh, given to working people in Europe by the largesse of the capitalist class. It was because they were genuinely afraid of revolution. I love how uh, Shama, like me and CJ, is not afraid to say names, to call out names here. Uh, like many of the cheerleaders, like Alec and many others that cheer on labor leaders. I, I will never forget like the, the one of the, the dumbest su section of left Twitter that when we initially gave our critiques of the labor leaders over the last few years, they were like, see, this is another example of our being shifting to the right. They coming out as anti anti-union. I still remember the dumbest, like, liberal too, yeah. report. And CJ, you know what I'm talking about. These people, that was yeah. their smear. You know, like, see, RBN don't support labor because they don't understand the Marxist critique of the la labor aristocracy. They don't understand that the labor aristocracy forms in this capitalist system and, ha and has hijacked uh, unions in our country and turned them inefficient. So you got to see that. And that's why I love that you point out. And that's something that we got to continue because people often look at uh, people who are in leadership and labor position and assume that they are uh, beyond criticism. And then when RBN, when we came out and criticized them, people lost their fucking mind. You shot their system, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, if you guys know on X, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. But like the liberals, like the 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 people with uh, RBN the Rainbow Syndrome, they, they just use that as another example. But go ahead, uh, uh, Sean Marcus. Yeah, let's, let's move into our final... Um... Uh, segment that we've all kind of been itching and, and alluding to about third parties having a a new uh, party for working class people without sellouts. I do want to start with this segment. This is another clip from On Strike. Make sure you check it out. This is uh, Shama Sawant's podcast. It's a great. Uh, I'm surprised it's so good. Are you just this is your first podcast? This is yes. What, I mean, for a person who's do, this is your first time. This is a, actually a very well put together podcast. So make sure you check it out. But let's listen to this clip about um, as we talk about uh, third parties and Democrats targeting third parties. Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden and the Democratic Party's vicious attacks on working people and their loyalty to the billionaire class throughout their history are precisely what paved the way for Trump to be elected in the first place. And now, once again, Biden's failure to stand up for working people and his blatant warmongering are leading to the very real risk of Trump getting reelected. We warned that a lesser evil vote for those Democratic candidates against Trump would not stop Trumpism. And sure enough, right-wing populism has grown in the form of Trump now leading in the polls in this election. It's been Biden himself and his policies and actions over the course of his whole presidency that have caused this dramatic loss of support amongst the historic voting base of the Democratic Party. And if we continue to rely on him and the Democratic Party establishment as the force that's going to protect us against Trump, I mean, they have proven that they are not up to that task. They have proven that they are not able to win over and build the confidence of young voters, voters of color, immigrant voters, working class voters. They have had the opportunity over the last four years to prove uh, prove themselves and uh you know, show that they're able to build up uh, a solid defense against Trump. And they have completely failed to do that. It's not because most Americans love Trump or agree with 
uh, his positions on most things, it's because Biden and the Democrats have just so completely failed to offer any kind of viable alternative. Really, there is nothing that can stop this growth of support for Trump other than starting to build a party that actually addresses the things that are important to working people, that can actually win confidence and win support from working people, young people, people of color. It's not a, a job that we can put off any longer because we've seen what has happened to Trump's support. While we've been taking this strategy of relying on Biden and the Democrats, his support has grown. And if we want that trend to reverse, we need a new strategy. We need a strategy of actually winning support on the basis of a program that actually appeals to the interests of the majority of working class Americans. And if Biden's not going to do that, which he's not, then we need to start building up uh, you know, a, a new party uh, and uh, support around third party candidates who, who do support that type of program. It feels like, and make sure you check out the uh, the, the podcast again. It, 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 it feels like, it, I've never seen the lesser of two evils so crystallized in a an election season because it's never been the lesser of two evils of genocide and and it's really the 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 options we have is genocide versus genocide with a side of muslim ban that's literally the option that we have here but uh, I'm just broadly uh, speaking do you feel the hunger? Can you see the hunger for a some other option the same way that I see it, the same way that Nick may see it? You see it in the protests of every protest march. You see it in the anger. You see it in the polls that people are so starving, are so hungry for another uh, option. So could you speak to that in, in whatever other part of that video you wanted to uh, comment on? Yeah, in fact, CJ, I think you were um, alluding to polls. I mean, just look at the polls as a starting point. We're seeing these polls from January, for example. I mean, there's many polls, and there's you can spend a lot of time talking about polls, but just highlights uh, polls from January that shows that uh, Biden has uh, alarming weakness among those who were considered, as the corporate media has described, stalwarts of the Democratic base. And who is that? That's black working class and poor voters it's hispanic and other voters of color again working class people but especially of these um uh, ethnic communities who traditionally have understood very clearly that the republicans are obviously anti-immigrant anti-people of color and so uh, see themselves as obviously then wanting to vote for the democrats but but this this idea that all you can have on offer is a Biden or a Trump is now starting to wear thin on increasingly more people. And I'm I'm not saying that that will mean that we won't have to contend with lesser evilism going into November. We will have to. And that is why I appreciated you playing that explanation from Kaylin Nicholson of Socialist Alternative, where she explained what is the actually the source of Trumpism. That's the most important thing for us to understand in order to break people from the Democrats. It's not like people are voting for Biden when they do vote for Biden out of lesser evilism because they're stupid. It's because they are correctly afraid of what could happen with the rise, of, you know, Trump 2.0. Uh, but that's why we have an obligation to explain why that does not work, why voting for Democrats is not going to lessen Trumpism in, in any way. So look at the polls, right? So now you have as the corporate media calls the stalwarts of the democratic base, meaning Hispanic people actually, where we see that the uh, Donald Trump is leading among Hispanic voters yeah. and young people. Yeah. And one in five black voters, 20% now say that they'll support a third party candidate in November. And so, which means that they're breaking from Biden. So absolutely there is a hunger. If you just look at the polls, you can see the hunger, the fact that the, uh, Biden is in danger in the battleground states that itself shows that the hunger is expressed by the uncommitted vote as well as we were talking about earlier. And in fact, it's unfortunate that it has not had a far higher level of organization. And what I mean by that is not only on the nitty gritty of organizing to get the maximum possible vote, because, you know, this is the primary. Most working people don't vote. So having that on the ground effort is crucial. But uh, 
as important, if not more, is the po politics of the campaign. Unfortunately, they haven't had the political clarity that we need this to be connected to a strategy to vote against Biden and Trump in November. You know, that would have been that would, that's the single presenting that strategy of breaking from the Democrats and Republicans and finding a viable option. You know, if, even at the very least saying vote for Stein and uh, um, West as a stepping stone for a new party that would have brought out many more voters to vote uncommitted because you know to your point cj from earlier one of the reasons people don't come out and vote is because they don't see a strategy to break from biden and trump and that it doesn't you know it doesn't excite them and it doesn't make them feel like this is useful and so all of this uh you know sh needs to be done really uh in and but it shows the hunger behind it and uh, the the fact that Cornell West campaign has not succeeded in capturing that imagination is not is not because there isn't excitement for a left campaign. There there is much more so than uh, earlier years, as a matter of fact, and that's why it's criminal that the Cornell West campaign is not a hundred times stronger than it is today. Because this was you know Cornell West declaring his candidacy was one of the potentially the biggest ever openings for independent left politics in US history, perhaps since Eugene Debs. And it's it's a crime uh, for, uh, you know, against the working class and the poor that that opening has been missed. But we still, we still want the best, strongest, best thing possible uh, going into November, the strongest possible vote for West and Stein in November, uh, despite all those tremendous weaknesses and, and failures. And we want revolutionary socialism to build itself out out of this process. And, and that's why we are talking about raising support for a new party. Because as you know, for Marxists, elections are not an end in, this, end in themselves because they don't actually change anything. As we have done in Seattle, we use elections for our own purpose. That is how Socialist Alternative used our movement for Bernie. You know, it, it was to uh, put forward revolutionary socialist politics, not, not to promote Bernie. And all of this is geared as our campaign against the capitalist class to expose the capitalist class and to build a socialist movement by raising the consciousness of working class people to organize the working class. Uh, I'll just mention, you know, in terms of just history, Lenin wrote a book, Ultra Leftism and the Infantile Disorder in the 1920s. And he did this to address various abstentionist ideas at that time, because you know we have to tackle both the selling out to the Democrats and the abstentionism, we have to fight against both. And he, he wrote this book to address the abstentionist ideas at the time to fight back against the sort of the um, one, one social, well, sorry, one solution revolution type of uh, idea that uh, prevailed at that time. Uh, from the abstentionists, you know, this, it's a very abstract idea. Yes, we all agree one solution revolution, but then what? You know, not failing to provide a concrete way forward at every moment, connecting with consciousness and then fighting to raise it. All of those are failures and you're not going to have a socialist revolution unless we do that. I mean, you know, in the wake of the Russian revolution, the idea that we could skip over elections, that we could stop orienting towards unions, some of these, you know, mistaken ideas came about all this was wrong and uh this is book to uh, that that book that i mentioned from lenin was meant to fight back against those ideas where uh there's a failed strategy on both counts and we have to fight against both and that's our obligation that's why we can never be in a comfort comfort zone where we're trying to make peace with the people who are mistaken even inside the movement yeah well said <laughs> Can you can you just I know uh, we're just squeezing a couple of more questions here about third parties, because I'm sure a lot of people would be curious to know your opinion about um, you. You know, you've here and there talked about Cornell West. You've specifically talked about RFK. There's Dr. Jill Stein. There's Claudia. Um, I'm sure I think there's some other independent candidates here and there. But those are the four that kind of stand out to me as clear independent. Um, what they're calling as independent or third party uh, candidates. What do you think about the field of candidates overall? And when you kept referring to the word criminal, uh, as far as when what what Cornell West has, has how he opened his campaign and to where it is now, um, 
uh, Ajamu Baraka and Margaret Kimberly both use a uh, historic mistake in this instance because it feels like it hasn't been this perfect storm for a third party movement to, to sort of grow. This is, is so fertile for third party for an independent sort of movement to take uh, place. So could you speak to just overall the whole candidate feel in this space where we have this perfect storm for a third party to sort of uh, uh, take off? And then is there a sort of singular person um, or do you do you believe that it's a good strategy for the majority of those who are non-establishment like us radicals who want should we all sort of get behind a singular person? Is that a better strategy? Or as long as they're voting for one of the three, I would say not including RFK, that's okay. Like what is sort of your take on, on that? Absolutely. We need the strongest independent left vote. And so having a divided left vote is not going to help. And so it's not leadership. If people are saying, even out of good intentions that, oh, vote for whichever one you want to vote for, uh, you know, in, in among among the PSL and West and Stein, we want, we just want, I mean, we, I do see well-intentioned people on the left saying, I don't, I'm not dictating to you which one you should vote for, just vote for one of them against Biden and Trump. Obviously, it's better than voting for Biden or Trump, but it's not a question of just, it's not a, it's not a, an electoral calculation we can that's not that can't be our approach and this is why i'm uh, you know emphasizing the need for revolutionary clarity in all of this is that for us it's not an electoral calculation that oh just out of for me to feel good about myself as a as a voter as a working person i voted for one of them and it doesn't matter what the overall strategy is no there has to be a unifying strategy for the left and in a presidential year, that unifying principle, you know, on a basis of principle unity, that unifying strategy has to be to uh, fight for the strongest possible left independent vote. And that is not going to be possible uh, if you have splintered votes, if you have a divided left vote where some people are voting for some and the others, where some candidates are appearing on the ballot in some states and not others. All of that is problematic. And that is why I use the word criminal in the sense that uh, for Colonel West to have left the Green Party ticket, that means that uh, he is not going to be on the ballot, on uh, very likely on very many states at all. And instead, a united one of, for example, of West and Stein would have been much better. It's it, even now it would be much better if West and Stein decided to get on the same ticket, and not just stopping there, but then really build a campaign, like use the months from you know May through. Uh, through October to really build a campaign that is a hundred times stronger than either of them are right now. And, you know, so uh, the failure or the, uh, sorry, the absence of any such strong campaign on the left, like I'm talking about is not because there isn't a hunger for it. And this touches on the earlier theme you were talking about, but more because of the failures of the left leadership. Uh, and, um, you know, um, so, it's it's it shows that the leadership on the left has to get its act together. Uh, it's true, of course, that in the absence of any such unifying strategy on the left, obviously, needless to say, it's much better that people vote for whichever left candidate is on their ballot. So, for example, if you're voting for PSL in California or wherever, then voting for Biden, obviously, that's much better. But what we need really on the left is a, a, a united ticket of someone like Weston Stein uh, and then campaign with mass rallies uh, and really getting their act together and, and building a historic left campaign. And then not, again, not see all of these are important things and none of this is easy. First, the strategy, understanding that you need to do have, have that united ticket for the left and then building a campaign that can really reach a mass proportion, but then also coming out of that, having organizing meetings to present a strategy for what happens what ha what happens after all that energy is put in after november we we don't have an idea that uh, the left ticket is going to win so it really the it, again as i said it's not about electoral calculations really the objective of doing any of this would be to use it as the basis to build something coming out of that in terms of a new party building something new 
Um, and yeah, I mean, it's really, um, when it's you're, really when you're trying to talk to somebody about, about this, how do you respond to what about Trump? What is your response to what about Trump when you're talking about building this outside party, when you're talking about supporting unifying a, a, around possibly like a Jill Stein, Cornell West combined ticket? Like what, what is your response to, um, or answer to what about Trump? I mean, as, as we said before, and as Kaelin said earlier in the clip that you played, our starting point actually is to acknowledge that Trump 2.0 would is you know presents an ominous development, uh, but that precisely because we want to defeat the right wing, we want to defeat Trumpism, we have to recognize that it is really at the doorstep, the, 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 the rise of Trumpism and the reactionary current in the US is actually at the doorstep of the betrayals of the Democratic Party and Biden himself. You know, one of the reasons uh, you'll, you'll see young people saying why they support Trump versus Biden is uh, just a shorthand. And Ryan Watson, one of our, uh, one of the socialists we interviewed in a member of Socialist Alternative, we interviewed Black Socialist, and he's a leader in our Black Caucus, Socialist Alternative Black Caucus. We interviewed him to talk about uh, what is happening, like why is uh, why are twenty percent of Black people, working people, supporting, uh, uh, sorry, refusing to support Biden and want to support an independent candidate? And one of the points he made was that uh, Black people, Black working people, young people feel completely betrayed by Biden. Uh, a shorthand, what they'll say is, uh, and Ryan talks about this in the interview we did it with him on strike is, you know, uh, Trump was the guy who gave us the COVID benefits. Biden was the guy who took them back. And obviously it's not as clear cut as that. And neither of them wanted to give us working people anything. Yeah. It was because of the pressures on them and just the severity of the crisis that forced their hand. But the point is that it's, it's the betrayals by Biden taking away the COVID benefits, especially child tax credit, which, you know, plunged uh, the biggest, the biggest sort of decrease in, uh, sort of increase in poverty uh, and the biggest decrease in poverty with the giving of the child tax credit. That's how crucial it was. Taking that away, the failure to address student debt, no, no, uh, no, no, uh, allegiance to the ideas of Medicare for all, no $15 an hour, just absolute betrayals of working people and the failure for to stand up for ordinary people and working people. All of that has created an avenue for now the real prospect, a real possibility of Trump getting reelected. How is it How is it that it, that's even happening? So we, we talk about all of that. And also it's important to point out history. I mean, it was the attacks by the Democrats on working class people for decades, including attacks by Barack Obama, who let's not forget was the deporter in chief. All of those betrayals by Democrats like Obama, who was a black president and mm -hmm. uh, attacked the interests of working people, including black working people, all of that at that time led to the rise of the Tea Party. It was the betrayals of Obama that led to Trump's rise. It was the failure of Hillary Clinton to stand for nothing other than corporate interests and billionaire interests that allowed him to win. Uh, it was their crushing of the Bernie campaign inside the Democratic Party that uh, opened the door for Trump to win. So it's 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 a long history of betrayals that are leading up to the potential of a Trump 2.0. We cannot dissolve these threats of the rise of Trump and the right wing by simply voting. You know, every presidential election, we we say, oh, let let this time let's vote for. Biden, let's let's uh, deal with it later. No, that is precisely what keeps fueling energies into the Trump. So uh, trying out the completely failed strategy again and again does not work. We need a new party for working people. And just to cap off with this hat headline, the parties and, and how it's sort of a perfect storm. Oh, you're home. OK, uh, sort, sort of like it's a perfect storm. Um, the Democrats see this perfect storm. The Democrats see this perfect storm, and this is what they're doing. The Democrats all out war on third parties and independent uh, candidates. So in this article, I won't read the article, but the article goes into how they're putting in a lot of money and effort 
because they see um, the threat of third parties in these, in, in specifically in these battleground states. So they're hiring a team of lawyers to get these candidates off of ballots. That is the strategic plan they have. They've done several articles on it and actually several segments on cable news. I don't know if you've seen it, but what is your take on the Democrats' plan to sort of uh, crush third parties in 2024? There's no doubt that they are very nervous, and especially in battleground states, the the the, the margins are so slim and that as as democratic pro democratic party commentators themselves, you know, the the corporate media commentators themselves, liberal media themselves have acknowledged Biden has a real problem on his hands and that this will be an election that is won or lost on the margins. And you can see, uh, for example, just take the example of Michigan, where the the uncommitted campaign, and I mean the campaign to win the uncommitted vote, I'm not necessarily talking about any campaign label, they, they their goal was to win 10,000 uncommitted votes because they had you know they had started planning a little bit later and all that and they won more than 10 times that uh, over 110,000 uncommitted votes and uh that is uh 10 times the margin by which Trump defeated Clinton in 2016 so it is really uh, a battle at the margins for Biden and the Democrats so it's no surprise at all that they are going to go out against all out against the third party candidates. Obviously, I'm mainly concerned about and we should be mainly concerned about uh, what kind of um, hate campaign that they're going to conduct against Jill Stein and Cornel West and um, and other left candidates in the sense that we've already seen that we've seen that playbook, the way they demonized Jill Stein for the election of Trump, we don't agree with any of that. We And we said that very clearly. We said that the reason Clinton, Hillary Clinton lost is because, and the Democrats lost, is because they are they presented the epitome of corporate um, elitism as their candidate. And so what, what did they expect was going to happen is working people are angry, are angry at Democrats like Hillary Clinton. And uh, again, that, that history also shows that ultimately, Voting for a Democrat, whether it's Biden or Clinton, is never going to be, or Obama, for that matter, is never going to be the solution if we want to end Trumpism. Absolutely. And I believe we've come to, <laughs> and it's always a great conversation. Um, I did have to cut a couple of things out of here, but I think we will have you on sometime in the future. We tr we're trying to reach out to... We, in this election season and this season where we feel like is important to sort of um, organize and get people to understand a new party, galvanize around a third party candidate. We we're, we're wanting to reach out to people like you, to Ajamu and, 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 and Margaret Kimberly, just, just giving you guys a heads up. We want to try to schedule you like once a month, maybe a, just to, to kind of revisit, hey, this is where we're at. We this is what we want to do because we really think it's important to to galvanize in this particular election around third parties to really try to push people out of the duopoly, out of the red and blue teams, on out of out of that into onto uh, the third party sort of community or independent party community. So um, just giving you a heads up on that, but. Is there anything you wanted to shout out? Is there anything you, one more comment you wanted to make about a particular topic or anything before we we uh, close out here? Just to say that in terms of concrete steps, people should look out for the several things. Like one of them is workers strike back meetings on Biden, Trump, uncommitted. What is the way forward? Why we need to build a new party, all of that. Uh, if you can just show the the web, uh, if, if basically you can go to worker strike back slash events, you'll see uh, public meetings that we're hosting in multiple cities. Some of them have already happened. Uh, the one in Seattle is about to happen and a couple of other cities, including Philadelphia, is, uh, are going to happen. So if you happen to live in those cities, uh, please join us and, and definitely go to workerstrikeback.org and check 
check that out, you know, become a member and also go to on strike show on YouTube and subscribe to our show. And also for those of uh, your listeners who are viewers who are, uh, who understand the need for, uh, to fight for socialism, I really urge you all to contact socialistalternative.org because ultimately we do have to build the socialist revolutionary movement, which is, which as always is, is going to be the backbone of any successful struggle. And then also I just wanted to uh, mention two things. One is that Worker Strike Back will be uh, hosting a national Zoom meeting and Socialist Alternative will be co-hosting, of course, a national Zoom meeting about the way forward for uh, to November some sometime in May and we haven't decided the date. And also just to mention, and I think you guys were allu alluding to this earlier, is that when the uh, Democratic Party has its national convention in Chicago in August, we need working people there in mass numbers. We need mass protests outside the DNC. Suddenly, Chicago Socialist Alternative and uh, Socialist Alternative around the country will be helping to build that and also workers strike back as well. So hopefully we'll see you Our on strike. will be there on the ground. Absolutely. And I did show the website. Much appreciated, Shama, for, for joining us. We, we know we understand that you're you know busy. There's a lot of there's a lot of active activity you're doing on the ground. There's a lot of work you're doing. There's a lot of people that want to speak to you. So we do appreciate you giving us uh, two and a half hours almost today. But it was a it went by fast because this is a lot of topics that is very needed to talk about because it is our belief that um, the revolution starts with your mind and you have to. That's why we feel we, we started RBN. We felt like in order to get people to the place of organizing, we first have to sort of raise consciousness. Um, and that's what we feel part of our job is here. But organizing is also part of what we want to do. So we we absolutely love being in community with Worker Strike Back with On Strike. And make sure you check out On Strike. I'm telling you the podcast, it's a great podcast. There's a lot more info. I would say it's a lot more informational than ours, maybe. So it's a great podcast to check out. Um, I think you shouted out everything. Was there any last words before I put you in the background here? Just to say that, uh, so again, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Nick and CJ, for having me on, and uh, everyone at RBN. Uh, we'd love to do a joint show on with, of on strike and oh, RBN oh, sometime nice. soon. So we'll be in touch with you about that. Yes, yeah, yeah, we'll talk in the background about that. That would absolutely be great. Anything, Nick, you want to say to Shama before she? I put her in the back. Yeah, I'm definitely down for uh, the joint stream. Uh, one thing I got to shout out, I got to get out here too, CJ. Uh, okay. I have uh, Fiorella Isabel. She joined me on Thursday. A lot to talk about regarding Moscow. Uh, Nick and I, I'm down doing a solo show tomorrow. Just because I got a lot to talk about. So uh, I'm planning a solo show tomorrow. And Thursday, I will have Fiorella. Once again, always great to have you on, Shama. Always great to be in conversation with you. So, uh, CJ, if you don't mind, pass you. I actually got to get it. Yeah. Gotta get yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. And uh, Shama, I'll also put you in the back again. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to quickly read uh, the... Oops, I thought I put Nick in the back. I, I didn't. Oh, there we go. I'm going to quickly read through um, the Super Chats only because I, I have to leave too. I was going to... Nick has to leave, but I was going to tell him the same thing, but um, I'll be slightly late picking up my... Data slightly, not by a lot. Uh, here goes one libertarianism coined by communism. That's, and then here's DC also. Thank you, DC, for these two super chats. Speaking as a two time libertarian LNC delegate, Libertarian Socialist Caucus, that is, you may wanted to make clear you understood that. This one from Janice. Thank you. Good strategy would be to vote for whichever anti-establishment candidate on the most state ballots. Yes. I would believe that would probably be Jill Stein. Thank you, Janice, for that super chat. Um, here's another one from D.C. The D.C. fraud lawsuit federal ruling applies equally to all political parties, including the Green Party, Libertarian Party, all party primaries are fixed and fake as fuck. Another one from Janice. Just got my invite for Worker Strike Back event for 2 p.m. Saturday. Plaza in, is that bed -Stuy? Literally came in while Shama was speaking. Look at that. 
This one here from Barbara, wisdom and guidance for the people to mobilize and win together what we need. Gratitude to RBN, Shama Sawant, and the On Strike Show. Thank you, Barbara, for that super chat. This one, Dino, keep up the excellent work. Thank you. This one from Abiding71. Thank you for the super sticker. Brand new member, Joe Swartz. Brand new member, welcome. And then a member for six months is that gang, gang green thumb. Not just abandon Biden, abandon Democrats. That is a that should come on a shirt. This one from Yin Yang Eclipse. I'm looking forward to Shama endorsing Jill 2024. Demoralization is a oops, I didn't click. Oh, did I click it? There we go. Also, brand new member for new six months. Demoralization is a feature, not a bug. And it's is a uh, is M R P. I think that's how you say it. This one here. What does Shama mean by Chinese imperialism? I didn't catch that. Um, but I've heard other Marxists. Um, there's a Marxist channel, RBN follows and retweets and that Marxist channel does talk about Russia and China in those terms. So there are some differing opinions amongst Marxists, but thank you for this uh, super sticker, James. Also this super sticker, James. And I didn't read this one. This one from John Freeze. I did read that one. My bad. Thank you for that, John Freeze. All right. That's all of the super chats for today. Thank you for watching. Sorry to have to leave so abruptly, but this was a fantastic stream. Make sure you check out our website. Make sure you support RBN.